knocked. Would it be possible to listen to something a little more uplifting, maybe? How about a song with a bit more attitude, perhaps? Right, that's enough. Stop the car. That's the last time I let you drive us anywhere. There, much better. Sometimes, a writer will create a character that plays it safe. This character will sit comfortably in the back row, they'll play their position just enough so you know that they're there, but for the most part they won't be doing too much to steal every scene or upstage their co-stars. A safe character's role is usually kept neatly in the pocket without rocking the boat, and while they might present an uneventful personal storyline or two, they tend to be fairly pleasant characters to have around, despite not doing much. It's these safe characters who offer the most opportunity to surprise us if the writers are brave enough to take them in such a direction. And in this particular case, Ignis is one such safe character to do something so momentous it not only permanently changed him, but affected the group's dynamic around him. Characters like this have the power to alter your opinions of them. If they are written strongly enough, then we might even be left with a lasting impression, something that solidifies the character in our memories for years to come. With the bizarre way that the writing for Final Fantasy XV had been handled, the last thing I expected Square Enix to do was suddenly kick me so bloody hard in the feels, especially with a character as safe as Iggy here. I didn't see it coming, and considering I waited a year after its release to finally play Final Fantasy XV, the fact that I didn't come across a single spoiler regarding Ignis in that entire time meant people really understood the gravity of experiencing his story firsthand. It's one of those things you have to see for yourself, and I'm really glad I didn't have it ruined for me personally. I know I usually start these episodes with a brief introduction before I slap you lot with a spoiler warning screen, and that screen is there for a reason, I do mean it when I say you should expect spoilers from my videos, but this is one of those rare times where I'll say beforehand, before the spoiler warning even comes up, if you haven't played Final Fantasy XV for yourself but intend to check it out at some point, then seriously, don't watch this episode of Who Dat yet. I don't want to ruin it for you, play it for yourself and see how you feel about him first. That said, if you're already up to speed, or you just straight up don't give a damn, then here's the spoiler warning, and here I go. Eh, you should probably expect spoilers. Ignis was born into a family of retainers and personal advisors that served the Lucian royal bloodline. At a very young age, Ignis was assigned to serve Noctis in particular after the prince's mother had passed away. To fill such an important role, throughout his childhood, Ignis was intensively taught a variety of subjects, learning all the skills that would be necessary in aiding Noctis throughout his life. As he slowly came of age, Iggy's duties increased, requiring him to attend high-level council meetings with the central court and even with the king himself. When he was not busy doing that, he was busy dealing with a teenage Noctis, the lazy asshole, cooking meals for him and tidying up his big boss man style apartment. Ignis being the good guy that he is does it all without a second thought, but isn't beyond politely asking Noctis to try and live a better lifestyle than the one he's currently living. Nice one, Iggy. Later on, once the events of the game begin to unfold, Ignis is the designated driver for the group, taking them out on the road and preparing their meals for them so they don't have to eat flipping cup noodles for 40 years. Fuck you, Gladio. Towards the latter half of the game, our Chocker Bros finally arrive in Altitia, where they are to meet Noctis' future bride-to-be, Luna Freya. And then in typical fashion, all hell breaks loose with the Niflheim army turning up to lick shots, while big beastie Leviathan pisses herself and floods the entire city. Ignis is separated from the rest of the group during all this chaos, with Noctis getting rendered unconscious in the process. In the aftermath, Noctis awakens a few days later to see his old friend Ignis sat beside him. But he's a different Ignis now. An Ignis that left the Battle of Altitia with a hefty price and scars that would never heal. But how did Ignis end up like this? Ha! <laughs> You'll have to drop some money bags on additional content, my famalam, because you know damn well they locked that shit away on DLC. God, Square Enix! Visual design. As is the case for the central cast of Final Fantasy XV, their clothing has to be drenched in black garments to highlight the fact that they're representing the royal family. Ignis being a personal advisor to the Lucian Prince means he's no doubt going to be swimming in dark tones, and as I've mentioned before, it's just a little too gloomy for my personal tastes. 
However, for what it's worth, the clothing items that Ignis is wearing are actually suited to these sorts of colours because, well, he's wearing a suit. And a sharp suit, no less. Having worked in the clothing industry for most of my personal life, I can tell you that if you want a safe, solid suit but you're unsure of what colour to get it in, bruv, choose black. It's been the default colour for menswear suits for, ugh, I don't know, a good few hundred years now? Black is the most reliable colour for a suit due to how neutral it is. It keeps the overall attire looking smart and sharp, and since black goes with every other colour, you can incorporate secondary colours into the mix for a bit of personal flair without suddenly clashing the whole outfit. Of course, in Ignis's case, he is pretty restricted to the assisting tones that he can use, with only his shirt creeping in a secondary colour, which is just a very, very dark purple. So dark, in fact, that for ages I honestly thought it was black until I had a closer look. The only other item of clothing on him that attempts to do something different are his driving gloves, which offer a shiny silver hue to his palette. Aside from that, everything else he's wearing is black, from his footwear to his jacket. His dusty brown hair does lighten his design up just a tad, but not by a lot, and most of Ignis' appearance is secured in giving off the gloomy vibe that the Lucians are known for. I have to admit, I do love the look of a good suit. I think out of the four main boys, Ignis is probably wearing the outfit that is most visually pleasing to me. He's a smart, dapper chap, tucking his shirt in so he's presentable, but also displaying an air of comfort and ease about him due to wearing the outfit without a tie and leaving his collar popped with the top button open. It's just a really nice look to give the character, and even with tones that are as suffocating as this, Iggy keeps himself looking fresh and clean. Personality Considering we just talked about his smart dress sense, it's worth beginning this section by highlighting the fact that the reason Ignis presents himself in such a manner is because of his upbringing. Born into a family of royal advisors, Iggy was raised to be smart and presentable when in the presence of others. As such, these lessons also taught him how to speak coherently and clearly in a respectful manner. Attending meetings with the highest members of the Lucian Council meant constantly putting those lessons to use, and naturally over time it became standard for him to speak this way. And how does he speak? Like a posh British dude, because of course he does! The roads are perilous at night. Let us wait for morning. My royal duty per His Majesty. First comes to Sky, a region known for its weapons. There was an attack. The Imperial Army has taken the Crown City. I mean, holy fanny trumples. There's posh, and then there's Ignis, yeah? He's a posh man's posh. He's posh beyond the limits of posh. He's exceeded what is humanly possible for one man to sound like when speaking in a posh accent. Yeah, I want to hear this dude having a conversation with Bayonetta, you know. Can you imagine the banter? You want to touch me? Indeed. Bad boy. Right. Oh. It's not over yet. You've been naughty. Spoke too soon. Oh. <laughs> For real though, I think it's a great accent, despite sounding so incredibly over the top at times. It works for him and he makes it his own, giving him his own unique presence when the guys are chatting amongst themselves. During interactions, Ignis is the most composed character from the group, carrying a cool demeanour without letting too much rile him up. He keeps his feelings in check, opting to rationally think his response through instead of flying off on knee-jerk reactions. This tends to get him labelled as a serious guy, and although he can be considered as such, he regularly shows that his personality is not unaccustomed to the light-hearted side. Iggy has an ear for harmless sarcasm and dry wit, sometimes dropping a nice little stinger of a sentence that instantly outsmarts anything else that was said in the conversation. He's playful, but in a very charming, concise, straight-laced sort of way. Ignis's level-headed thinking also anchors the group when things get heated and start kicking off between them. More often than not, he tends to be the voice of reason, giving other party members a different perspective to look from. And finally, Ignis is definitely the most intelligent party member here. Being taught how to assist the prince from a very young age meant his mind was crammed with a variety of knowledge, ranging from simple things like sewing garments and cooking meals, to more intense high-level skills like strategizing and armed combat. He's basically your mother, yeah? Iggy's your mum. Ignis's level of importance places him up there alongside Gladio, seeing as the pair of them are essentially Prince Noctis' caretakers. Yeah, the boys share a brotherly bond, but at the end of the day, by a royal duty alone, they have to stand with Noct either way, even if they hated him. So on those grounds, being the character to look after Noctis the most, Ignis' importance to the game is of the highest rank. Actually, even though I just made a joke about Ignis being your mum, there's actually some bizarre truth to his motherly role when you study the dynamic between Gladio and Ignis towards Noctis. Gladio comes across as a more stereotypical, short-tempered, hard-ass, tough-loving father figure to Noctis, always trying to make a man out of him. Ignis, on the other hand, fills a more softer and delicate role. He cooks for him, tidies up his crap, fixes his clothes when they're dirty or damaged, 
He even gives him the benefit of the doubt a lot, letting him get away with stupid shit when he knows he should be scolded. From a backstory perspective, it's even stated that Noctis' mother had passed away when he was very young, with the paternal role being filled out by Ignis instead, so even the narrative wants you to see Iggy as a mother-type figure. For what it's worth, this caring devotion to Noctis is made very apparent. Everything Ignis says about him carries a level of affection. It's one of the more believable bonds to feature in the game, and I get a much stronger sense of companionship between Iggy and Noctis than I ever felt from Gladio's connection to the Prince. Aside from that, Ignis also holds a lot of importance to the group he travels with. In fact, I'd go as far as saying he's likely the most important character in the party. He cooks for the group so they stay well fed, making sure they have the energy in them to keep going when things get bleak. He's also the team's vehicle driver, taking them from location to location and keeping the journey moving. His skills in strategy and tactics also come into play during combat where he analyzes the battlefield, finding ways for the party to get the upper hand. And his regroup technique saved my personal arse a million times. Thank you, Ignis, you beautiful bastard, I love you. So not only is his connection to the lead protagonist important, but his place within the team is a crucial one too. No matter which way you look at it, Ignis is one of the most valued characters that Final Fantasy XV has running around inside it. And yet, with all that said, for a long while during the game, I just never really noticed him. Is that weird? For a character to be so paramount, not paying attention to him feels like a silly thing to say, but it's true. I went for a good portion of the game keeping my eye on Gladio, waiting to be won over by him, but that victory never came. I spent a lot of time getting distracted by Prompto because he was loud and in my face. I kept waiting on Iris and Aranea to reappear every time they went away. But Iggy? He was safe. He was a safe character to me. He done everything right but never made a big song and dance about his presence. He was always just there. And this brings us full circle to what I said at the start of the video. If a character is being very safe, then it gives them the biggest opportunity to do something that shakes up the whole mood. And my god, Ignis did just that. I know I skirted around it earlier during the backstory run through, and you can tell I still didn't want to give the plot point entirely away. I was being hesitant out of respect for those who still might not have seen it, but here's where I have to cut loose and talk about Ignis' sacrifice at length due to just how much of an impact it left on me. So no more warnings now, the gloves are off. During the Battle of Altitia, when Ignis was separated from the rest of the group, he came into direct contact with the lead antagonist, Arden. Which is odd to suddenly mention because this is the third Final Fantasy XV character I've reviewed so far, and somehow this is the first time I've actually mentioned the main bad guy. Weird. Anyways, Arden has already shanked up Luna Freya, so she's finished. Noctis is out cold, so he's not helping. And Arden's got Iggy pinned down with an ultimatum. Join him, or die. It's at this point Ignis reveals he had been able to secure the Ring of Lucy, an item that contains the power of all the previous Lucian monarchs. The ring only allows the use of its power by those it deems worthy, and even then, a blood price must be paid for using it. Facing either death or having to betray his prince, Iggy said fuck that and put the ring on, granting himself a small portion of power to temporarily defeat Arden. If it wasn't for this act of heroism, it's more than likely our boys wouldn't have made it out of Altitia alive. But the cost was high. From using the ring, Ignis's eyes were burned out, completely robbing him of his eyesight and leaving him permanently blind. Let me tell you what this did to the character. The guy that hung at the back analysing the battlefield and making sure everybody could regroup and heal? Gone. He couldn't provide tactical support anymore. The dude who cooked the meals that gave the party the energy they needed to face another challenging day? Gone. He couldn't cook anymore. The man who spent hours upon hours every day driving his friends around making sure they reached their destination safely? Gone. He couldn't drive anymore. Even walking had reduced Iggy to a slow pace as he struggled to find his way with his walking cane in hand. The most reliable and steadfast character to ever accompany Noctis had taken one tremendous hit for the team at the cost of everything else the character was known for. The mood of the group instantly changed because of this too. There was no more witty banter or harmless fun. Gladio was angry more. Noctis was more confused and conflicted with what he should be doing. Poor Prompto could only sit on the sidelines and watch the group slowly tear itself apart. It became the most upsetting part of the game to see unfold. It changed the way I personally felt while playing the game as well. Ignis now moved at a slower pace, so out of respect and sympathy for him, I wanted to slow down too, but often found myself running ahead to try and clear objectives, resulting in Gladio yelling at me to slow down and show some consideration. I felt like shit. I felt even worse when I went through the in-game photo collection and saw pictures of Iggy laughing and smiling as he drove the car or ate a meal, knowing full well those days were long behind us now. Looking at those memories broke my heart, man. 
It only continued to feel increasingly bittersweet because Ignis's mentality towards his duties didn't change. Even with the loss of his sight, Iggy remained by Noctis' side regardless. He didn't quit on him. He never regretted his decision to wear the ring either. Hell, I don't even really remember him once complaining about his condition. This guy was an absolute soldier right until the very end. Ignis can't be denied his importance to Final Fantasy XV. He's not only connected to the lead protagonist, he's not only vital to the aiding of that protagonist, but due to some really ballsy writing on Square Enix's part, Ignis's turning point was such a major event that it landed itself as one of my most memorable character moments from the whole game. Safe characters come and go. Most of them never do more than they need to, providing us with the basics without stepping beyond themselves. In the worst case scenarios, they just fill up space. But Ignis didn't do that. Granted, he wasn't wowing me to begin with, he hadn't been doing anything major to win my greatest commendations, but for what it was worth, he was a pleasant guy to have in the group, and I liked him being there. What I didn't expect was a sharp change in direction, because frankly, I didn't think the writers for this game had it in them. Despite what the catastrophic event put the poor character through, I feel Final Fantasy XV needed something big like this. Character deaths were happening at various points throughout the game, and all of them were half assed or empty. It felt like there was no gravity to the hardships the boys were facing, because these moments kept coming and going with little effort or time being spent on the ordeals themselves. But when Ignis lost his eyesight, that hit me hard. We had spent so much time with him, we had gotten used to the person he was, so when he changed, it changed everything around him, including how I personally felt towards him. Is he one of my favourite characters? I won't say he is, because I wasn't entirely falling in love with him before the incident occurred, and let us not forget Square Enix did lock the unfoldings of this whole event away on DLC, because they knew people were gonna want to know how Ignis lost his eyesight, so why not make us pay extra for it, yeah? Suckers. Criticisms aside, after all is said and done, Ignis may not be one of my favourite characters here, but I will say this without a single doubt. Of all the characters this game threw at me, Ignis won the most of my respect. For the million things Final Fantasy XV did wrong, with Ignis they done something right. Something strong, something powerful, something very memorable, and something right. But they still shoved most of it onto DLC, so go on Square Enix! Yo yo, this episode was brought to you by these wonderful people supporting me on Patreon. Without their help, this show would not be able to continue. If you'd also like to support Who That, please check the link in the description. Any and all help would be appreciated. Cheers everybody. Yeah.